Stadiongruppe der Europa-Union möchte ich zunächst Kollegen des Abgeordneten des Deutschen Bundestags und Mitglieder einer der beiden Parlamentariergruppen hier begrüßen, die ich zumindest schon ausfällig gemacht habe. Herr Rosemann von der SPD, Herr Kulitz von der FDP, Herr Kronenberg von der FDP und Herr Schwabs von der SPD. Und an zweiter Stelle, aber am Herzen natürlich an erster Stelle, die Vertreter des diplomatischen Korps, Ihre Exzellenzen, der Botschafter des Kosovo, Herr Zufall, der Botschafter von Griechenland, Herr Esparoulis, der Botschafter von Asien, Herr Rappmann und die Botschafterin von Bulgarien, Frau schikane Oma. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie hier sind und es das zeigt, dass wir nicht nur ein Thema haben, was äh, zwar handelt von einem Land, von Nordmazedonien, sondern ein Thema haben, was eine ganze Region interessiert und betrifft. Und vielleicht auch, verehrter Herr Außenminister, was ein bisschen zeigt, dass Sie eine ganz beliebte Person sind in Berlin, auch beim diplomatischen Korps. Bevor wir anfangen, möchte ich sagen, es gibt eine Übersetzung. Sie finden die Übersetzungsapparate auf Ihren Tischen. Wir übersetzen simultan Deutsch, Englisch. Und abgesehen davon möchte ich darauf hinweisen, dass diese Veranstaltung heute Abend die Fortsetzung einer Reihe von Veranstaltungen ist, die wir etabliert haben, die die Südosteuropa-Gesellschaft federführend in Kooperation mit der Europa-Union veranstaltet und die deswegen einen ganz interessanten Kreis von Nerds zusammenbringt, der vorher gar nicht so oft zusammengearbeitet hatte, nämlich die Europa-Nerds und die Balkan nennt man das ja nicht, die südosteuropa nerds so nennt man das ja. Genau. Und äh, vielleicht ist das ja ein gutes Zeichen für das eigentliche Thema heute Abend, nämlich die Erweiterung, die Frage der Erweiterungsverhandlung, dass wir mit der Südosteuropa-Gesellschaft und der Europa-Union diese Erweiterung in beide Richtungen schon längst vorgenommen haben. Zuletzt hatten wir die Diskussion im November 2018, äh, Mazedonien zwischen Hoffen und Bangen, damals ging es um die Namensfrage. Und wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir wieder über Mazedonien, über Nordmazedonien inzwischen reden. Ich glaube, Nikola Dimitrov, es ist nicht zu viel, wenn ich sagen kann, dass wir alle sehr, sehr froh gewesen sind über die Ergebnisse, die unter Führung von Ministerpräsident Zypras und Ministerpräsident Saal mit hartkräftiger Hilfe auch vom Außenminister zustande gekommen ist. Und ich glaube, ich kann für meine Person zumindest sagen, aber auch für die Organisation, dass wir denken, dass es jetzt an der Europäischen Union ist und auch an den Mitgliedstaaten, diesen Mut, den die mazedonische Regierung an den Tag gelegt hat und die griechische Regierung an den Tag gelegt hat, auch zumindest etwas Mut, und ich glaube, viel mehr ist nicht nötig, bei den anstehenden Entscheidungen im Rat aufzubringen. Mehr möchte ich aber gar nicht inhaltlich sagen. Ich möchte mich herzlich nochmal bedanken für das große Interesse an der Veranstaltung und möchte Sie jetzt für den Rest des Abends in die verantwortungsvolle Runde von Adelheid Wölfe geben. Adelheid Wölfe vorzustellen ist eigentlich nicht nötig. Sie ist offiziell Südosteuropa-Korrespondentin, ach, das ist das Wort wieder, Südosteuropa-Korrespondentin von der österreichischen Zeitung Der Standard. Aber darüber hinaus ist sie, glaube ich, so etwas wie eine journalistische Legende, also Manchmal ist es so, dass Adelheid Wölfel als die schnellste Nachrichtenagentur der Region wahrgenommen wird. Und das ist für eine Person, die immer noch in einer Printmesse schreibt, glaube ich schon, das größte Kompliment, das man haben kann. Und Adelheid Wölfel wird ein Gespräch moderieren mit äh, unserem Freund, dem Außenminister von Nordmazedonien, Nikola Dimitrov, den ich hier auch nicht weiter vorstellen muss, aber der, glaube ich, sagen kann, nicht nur das gute Gesicht des Landes der in diplomatischen Beziehungen in Deutschland ist, sondern für mich auch, ähm, zumindest wenn ich das so persönlich sagen darf, das gute Herz einer Politik in der Region, die meiner Ansicht nach den richtigen Weg zeichnet für äh, die Region, aber damit auch ein Beispiel ist für die Europäische Union, nämlich des positiven Herangehens an Herausforderungen und des Versuchs, Schwierigkeiten gemeinsam zu lösen im Sinne äh, des strategischen Ziels und des strategischen Interessen, aber auch der Überzeugung, dass man etwas positiv verändern kann. Und äh, bevor ich jetzt zu so sehr ins Schwelgen komme, würde ich an dieser Stelle äh, übergeben. Wir beginnen mit einer Keynote äh, von dem Außenminister und danach führt Adelheid Wölfel ein Gespräch und wird dann auch die Möglichkeit geben, dass das Gespräch nicht ein Dialog bleibt, sondern eine Diskussion mit den Gästen auch. Abschließend möchte ich äh, noch alle äh, diejenigen, äh, Benennen, 
die diesen Abend hier heute ermöglicht haben. Ich möchte mich auch bei den Delegationen bedanken, die in der Leitung von Nikola Dimitrov hergekommen sind. Genau. Und bei dem Team der Südosteuropa-Gesellschaft, der Europa und dem Europa und dem Büro, heute Abend im Abend der Vielen Dank. Herr und Dame, my German is not up to the task today, but I'd like to still greet you with Liebe, Freundin und Freunde, and uh, special thanks to Zudost Europa Gesellschaft and the group here in the Bundestag Europa Union Deutschland. Manuel, I will hide. Um, I always have a big dilemma whether to read or talk when I have about 15 to 20 minutes. My team, who writes great speeches, usually advises me to talk because they say I perform better. <laughs> so I will talk. And um, I, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I think this event is really timely because we hope that some important debates will take place in this and other buildings of the Bundestag in uh, days to come. Uh, I bring you, uh, in the words of Minister Heiko Maas, who presented the rewards of the Munich Security Conference to Prime Minister Tsipras and Prime Minister Zayev this year, this February. He said, this year, good news, the good news comes from the Balkans. And I'm here to talk about that and about how to spread first consolidate and spread this good news. We in the Balkans are not quite used to hearing these words. And uh, it makes me really proud that we have been able to do something today to be proud of, because usually in our region people are proud of their history, but we fail to produce enough future. And this has been the mission, the task of my government. We are in office a bit less than two years. And we have an ambitious agenda of uh, resolving problems with neighbors and beyond that in our region and making North Macedonia, our country, a proper European democracy. Because we think that this is the only way to keep the next generation at home, the only way towards prosperity for us and the whole region. Um, we assumed office uh, helped by a very broad social mobilization that went across ethnic lines. We have a multi-ethnic society in our country. I myself, I'm a long time, long-term diplomat who turned an activist. And now I'm an accidental politician, uh, which is uh, a title of a book of another Greek accidental politician who is chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Greek Parliament. His name is Kostos Dizilis. Uh, I still feel political responsibility to do what I said in my rallies and speeches and campaigning. Uh, so, uh, this is what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to deliver by way of background. I've lived in the States, I studied in the United Kingdom, I lived in the Netherlands, so, um, and I followed obviously the German political debate and I'm not unfamiliar with the perspectives uh, in this important. First of all, the PRESPA agreement. This has been an issue that was unresolved for 27 years. Uh, many tried and failed. Many politicians on both sides of the border uh, used or misused the dispute to score points. The easiest thing to do for a politician when there is a deeply emotional problem is not to resolve it. Uh, it's enough to blame the other and you become a hero of the day. The problem with that approach to disputes is that 
you don't help the people. Um, and uh, we had, I, I call that policies of shallow nationalism, uh, defending quote unquote the national interest by using fear, to have fear, to have people afraid we need to have an enemy, we need to invest in that. And this is a narrative that prevailed uh, in the past from <coughs> many even build, build their political careers on, on this. Um, naming a country is not easy to understand uh, why is this people was there in the first place. We don't have enough time to go in an in-depth explanation, but essentially this is an issue of history, of identity, and identity is important. And we managed to resolve it uh, because my country, now Republic of North Macedonia, is part of a historic region that is bigger. There is a big part in Greece, there is a part in, in Bulgaria. Our part is in the north of this region, hence North Macedonia. But the crux of the Prespa Agreement is an article, a mechanism that enabled the two identities of what Macedonia is about to coexist and not confront each other. This is how we, we did this. Um, uh, under the leadership of our Prime Minister Zoran Zayak and the Greek Prime Minister uh, Alexis Tsipras. They decided to invest and spend political capital to remove an issue that was a burden in our bilateral relations and to invest in friendship between two neighboring countries and peoples. Um, this is in many, way, in many ways a very European approach to a problem. This is, there was a compromise. We learned in the process to trust each other. We learned to care about the basic, the most fundamental needs of the other. Because when a dispute involves two neighbors, you cannot resolve it by winning. Because winning for one side means losing for the other. You have to find a way to cover the basic needs of, of both neighbors. Um, it's also, it takes leadership because you have to think more about the next generation than about the next elections. And what we did created uh, a solidarity, a sense that we are in the same boat now, and that what's good for the neighbor is also good for us, and the other way around. We recently marked 9th of May, the Europe Day, where we talk about the Schumann uh, Declaration. And one quote of Schumann pretty much describes what we did and why I claim this, is, this was a very European uh, compromise. He said, Europe will not be created in one single goal, according, in accordance with a single plan, but it will be created in concrete achievements that create de facto solidarity. And this is uh, what we did uh, with our friends in, in Greece. To do it, we stopped the blame game, we focused on the core interest and less on uh, positions, especially on public positions. So one of the lessons that we learned is um, if you're serious about resolving a problem, you have to invest all of your political energy into that process and stop parallel fighting, blame games, uh, attempts to outsmart each other, you have to, full, to invest all of your cards in those talks. The ingredient is, of course, leadership and political will, because it takes two to do this, and um, this was done. So I, I think for our region, that um, is very 
famous for um, sitting in the trenches of history and looking at each other from these trenches. It took some courage to take to, to get out, walk, shake the hand of the other, and continue to, to, to walk further. Um, and it unlocks something very important for us. First of all, a huge potential between two neighboring countries. I, today, in the Greek Parliament, in the Committee on Foreign Affairs, they discuss two new border crossings and the upgrade of our embassies that used to be at the level of years and offices into embassies, both in Skopje and in Athens. Trade has already increased significantly, and interest of businesses on both sides to invest in the neighboring country is also increasing. Uh, we discuss cooperation on education, and in the area where we signed the agreement, in Kaispa recently, there were high school kids competing in sport and getting to know each other. So I think we have unlocked a major potential. What we have also unlocked is a European and a Euro-Atlantic future for my country that used to be locked in the waiting room uh, because of this problem. Uh, so to carry the PRESPA agreement at home, uh, we used the incentive of building friendship with the important neighbor. But we also use the fact that we will now remove the obstacle towards starting accession talks with the European Union and joining the uh, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. On both, there is an overwhelming support of the citizens for the EU 88, 86% and for NATO 84%. Um, we, I mean, I heard Manuel with a sigh on these numbers, on how popular the European Union is. It reminded me of a question of a journalist in London who said, why do you want to join when we are leaving? And I said, well, for those of you on the inside, sometimes you forget how cold it is on the outside. We live in a region that is encircled by EU member states. We are not bordering the EU, but we are surrounded by it. And this region, the Western Balkans, trades about three quarters of what we produce goes for the European market. For North Macedonia, Germany is the most important trading partner. Uh, almost close to half of what we produce goes to Germany. We are in this boat already. And I think we have to um, think honestly and openly about what do we do with this non-EU island within the if we want to make the countries of the region more European, governed by the rule of law, with functional checks and balances, and better economies, reforms and accession process is the way. Because the accession process is a reform is a tool to reform. If we are not interested in how this island operates and whether it is governed properly and whether it exports trade and uh, goods and services uh, or young people then we don't have to engage with this region. It is my genuine belief, not only because uh, it is my job to speak on behalf of the region and of my country, that engagement with the region and recognizing progress and recognizing backsliding, when there is backsliding, and sanctioning that, but rewarding progress, is the right thing to do and the less costly thing. Non-engagement uh, will probably be more costly. And we saw through the migration crisis of 15 and 16 how important the Western Balkans was for Europe's own security. 
So um, I think the future of this region is European. I don't think there is an alternative strategy. <coughs> and the lion's share of the work is on our own shoulders at home. We are the ones who need to change our countries. Um, what we have achieved in two years, and I'm going to use also the words of others to try to be more convincing, because obviously I will be positive about the, the performance of, of my own country. Freedom House, which is uh, a renowned organization that deals with democracy in the US, called us the most promising chance for a democratic breakthrough in Europe. Um, recently, the State Department Human Rights Report of 2018 said that we demonstrated, I quote, greater respect for judicial independence and impartiality compared to previous years. The Venice Commission, which is a group of legal experts associated with the Council of Europe, and they usually check draft legislation. They said in March this year, the constant efforts of the authorities of North Macedonia to bring the rule of government the judicial system in line with international standards and best practices are praiseworthy. Uh, the OSCE other observation mission, we recently had presidential elections. We elected a president on uh, the 5th of May, Mr. Pendarovsky said, uh, maintained a clear distinction between their official and political activities, avoided using state resources in the campaign, election was well administered, election day was peaceful, orderly, and transparent, uh, well administered run up to the presidential elections, respect for fundamental freedoms, Allow voters to make an informed choice between candidates. The election administration enjoyed public confidence. As in the first round, state officials appeared to maintain a distinction between their official duties and political activities. Um, reporters beyond borders. Uh, we jumped 14 places in terms of media freedom in the latest report, and the biggest criticism of this organization is that the state broadcaster still serves the interest uh, of the former ruling regime, uh, which is now in the opposition, so, which is not quite a compliment, but it says a lot that we are not really using the public broadcaster to serve the political interest of the government. Um, coalition. And then uh, the famous Democracy Index of the Economist put us in a small group of countries that made notable progress this year, together with Estonia and a couple of more countries. So, um, in a way, in accordance with the same never raised a good crisis. We woke up as a society. Uh, there is a, ve a very angry public opinion. People learned that if they're allowed, they can make a difference. And this enabled us to be self-confident enough to resolve difficult issues with neighbors. Also, a friendship treaty with Bulgaria that preceded the rest of the agreement with our friends in, in Greece and to invest in a society where we will prevent to have one person or a small group of people all political power in their hands in a society. But instead of investing in this, to have institutions that will check and that will recruit and prevent abuse. Uh, and this is our uh, agenda. My I am proud that I had a small role in all of these processes. And I just read an article today about German foreign policy, and I saw a quote 
of Helmut Kohl, who after the unification of Germany said, for the first time, Germany is surrounded only by friends and families. And this is what we have today in our region. We have five neighbors, and we have five friends and families. And the success of one is the success of the region, because we cannot be a prosperous, happy nation if your neighbors and your neighborhood is struggling. This is our vision for the region. Now, very briefly, and I will end soon on accession or the policy of the European Union towards this region surrounded by member states. Um, we, or I, I say we because I am European, even though the country is not part of the European Union, Europe learned lessons of previous rounds of enlargement. And it faces some important challenges from Brexit through migration that changed the political landscape on the continent, um, internal issues, and even crisis of the European narrative. Uh, seen from outside, I'll tell you what Europe means in my country and probably in the region. It means normalcy, decency, accountable politician. Uh, efficient fight against corruption and a democracy where you can say what you think and media are free to report or not to report and this uh, context enables and fosters economic development. This is what Europe means from our perspective. If we tend and if we damage this narrative, we have an issue, and I think Europe will lose its magnet and attractiveness. Um, the lessons from the, some rounds of enlargement, the one in 2007, and uh, some of these developments, created skepticism that the process actually works. Um, so, the Commission, in response to this skepticism, should change the way accession works. Fundamentals first, the whole process starts with rule of law and ends with rule of law. The process is now much more lengthy and the process is now much more uphill. While we were waiting as a nation in this uh, waiting room, Europe was not waiting and the journey became much more challenging and much more difficult. The trains are not that frequent, and when they make a stop, the stop is very brief. So we feel like we have to, we feel a sense of urgency because we have a moving target. And the target is not to formally join, which will make no real changes, but to use the process to change internally. We can do it on our own, it will take longer, and the forces, the pro-reform and pro-European forces, will be weaker if we don't have something to show in return for what we do. So I think this year, uh, for my country, which has been a candidate country for a generation, for 14 years, we lost a generation. When I uh, was 18, then, Republic of Macedonia became independent. I am now almost 47. We've been independent for 27 years, and we still haven't really crossed the line of certainty. And we still can't say that the start of the next generation, there is an intern here who is in that generation helping here in the Bundestag. We still can't say that their start will be better than start of my generation. This is what we have to do. Uh, we are awaiting a report of the European Commission. It will come after the European elections. We expect to have the best positive report so far. We already had nine positive reports in the past. Uh, and we still haven't started the journey. And I think this year, 
what Europe will decide on the file of North Macedonia will essentially be a message for the region. If what I generally believe are compelling case this year is not recognized, and if there is no decision to start accession talks, which I repeat is only the start of the process, and it could take two and three electoral cycle to end, depends on us, and on, on, on the EU and on the Commission, but mostly on our own reform performance. If this is not recognized, then the message is think twice before you make a brave decision, and before you put everything that you have in terms of political capital on reforms, then on good neighboring the mess and resolving difficult problems. This will be a message to all countries in the region. Uh, we don't feel we have to take accession honestly. If there is progress, and be as strict as possible on progress, because we don't gain by having a short term. We can't change our society if we are given a free or a short term. But if there is progress, we have to recognize and reward it, because if you reward merit, the region will deliver more merit. If you reward politicking, the region will deliver more politicking. The sticks and carrots of the accession process must be used along these lines. When you reward a country where uh, the prematurely, it backfires. When you don't reward a country, when you hold back a country because of something else, your own political situation, another country, etc., the process fails. So um, I don't think that we have a better tool. I think we have to use it. Uh, I think we have to speak openly about this. On the other hand, if we do so, this essentially brings more political responsibility on our shoulders because we have to deliver more. So, um, and it will send a message to capitals that delivering on reforms and resolving difficult problems is worth it investment, the political investment. Uh, in spite of uh, the difficult political situation in Europe today, forthcoming European elections, all the issues that are there, we simply don't have the luxury of failing to create success stories. And my country today, North Macedonia, is a success story needs to be encouraged and supported if we want to make a difference. And my big uh, lesson learned from all of this is we actually can make a difference. Because none of this, the reconciliation, the Crespa agreement, this was not inevitable on the contrary. It happened because we made it happen with the leadership in, in office. Regardless of whether we get the recognition or not, the direction is clear, we have to, but uh, the signal <coughs> will be that um, the pro-European forces are not uh, damaged. And this is a signal that will be a very wrong signal for a region that needs an encouragement, especially when it delivers at the time where we have a global uh, leadership. And because I'm in Berlin and in Germany, I have to compliment and I will share how you are seeing from our perspective in the region. Germany is in demand uh, in terms of leadership. Because the world that we would like to build in our region, and what we see in Europe and also beyond Europe, is a world, world governed by the rule of law, where people are free, and where individual liberties are respected, where media are free, where civil society is vibrant and very engaged, where countries deal with global issues 
by cooperating more and not less, because the issues are bigger than one, even the most important, the biggest nation of, of today. So, what we see, and we are grateful for that, we see leadership, we see engagement. Uh, there was encouragement throughout the PRESPA negotiations, also from, from Berlin to, to both parties. And we also welcome the recent engagement by the Chancellor in, together with the French President Macron, in one of the most difficult, the biggest issues, uh, the status of Kosovo, the negotiations between Belgrade and, and Pristina, which is also uh, an issue that touches upon us. We are, we are a country that borders both. And I think how our own compromise is treated will be a message to these two capitals as well. The recognition and the reward of our compromise will be a message to, to those. It will be an incentive to uh, continue with the normalization dialogue. I think I stopped here, more or less, probably at around 20 minutes, maybe a couple of minutes plus. Thank you. und Erfahrungen. Äh, guten Abend, ich freue mich äh, sehr hier zu sein, möchte mich auch bedanken für die Einladung und ähm, äh, meine Freude ist deswegen so groß, weil, ich, äh, zum, weil wir hier über Nordmazedonien äh, sprechen können. Ich, ich lebe auf dem Balkan und äh, fahre viel herum und rede mit sehr vielen Menschen und die meiste Zeit sprechen wir dann darüber, dass die Leute keinen Job kriegen, wenn sie nicht zu irgendeiner Partei gehen. Oder wir reden darüber, dass sie irgendwie äh, Schmiergeld zahlen müssen, wenn sie ein Haus bauen wollen. Oder wir reden darüber, dass sie auswandern wollen, weil sie keine Zukunft sehen. Äh, und ganz viele Leute glauben auch nicht, dass sich das jemals ändern kann. Und dann sitzt man sitz ich da und seit zwei Jahren oder so kann ich dann immer sagen, ja, aber es gibt Nordmazedonien. Oder jetzt würde ich sagen Nordmazedonien. Und dann gibt es immer so diese Diskussion, ja, also wirklich, was können wir jetzt davon lernen? Und es ist für mich wirklich das einzige, der einzige Staat, der auch innerhalb dieser Region so etwas wie Zuversicht kreiert. Und deswegen freue ich mich so, hier zu sein. Ja, und äh, Herr Minister Dimitrov, ich wollte Sie am Anfang fragen, ob Sie mit uns vielleicht eine Erinnerung teilen können. Sie haben ja darüber gesprochen, wie das Vertrauen entstanden ist in diesen Gesprächen mit den Vertretern Griechenlands. Und was mich so interessieren würde, wie ist denn das Eis gebrochen? Wann haben Sie wirklich den Eindruck gehabt, gab es so einen Moment, wo Sie gesagt haben, jetzt ist wirklich Vertrauen da und jetzt kann es wirklich weitergehen? Was war der wichtigste Baustein? War das die Kommunikation oder war das die Mischung an Leuten, die da zusammengekommen sind, die das zum Gewinner gebracht hat? Thank you for the kind words, also uh, for the country representing optimism and confidence. Actually, it takes a measure of self-confidence to resolve this problem. And countries show confidence when they resolve a deeply emotional uh, dispute. How did we build the trust? Um, when I took office, I talked to Prime Minister Zayak and I said, if you agree, I'd like to pay my first bilateral visit to Athens. And it took place on, in 14 days, on 14th of June 2017. And I said, I am here with one message. We have a hopeful moment. Uh, this is a last chance for my generation to make it. We need your help. And if you want to have a friendly European neighbor at your borders, now is the time to, to do this. There was readiness on the other side, there were attempts on their side previously with my predecessors. 
we had more meetings with then Minister Nikos Kosias than I was able to see my family. And he joked about that often as well. Uh, his name is also the same, but we did took many meetings, many attempts. I doubted him at the start and I think he doubted me. Because previously it was to pretend that you want to solve the problem so that you are more successful in the blame game that follows. So you say, I made three steps, they made no steps, so they are the bad guys. This used to happen in the past. Uh, but then after, and I, I don't think I can pinpoint to one exact day or meeting, but there was a sense that we are more together now than, and instead of Greece and now North Macedonia being the others, it became the two of us and the proponents of the compromise against the opponents of the compromise. So the confrontation line changed. And we, and we now have, and I hope that we will overcome that, because we talk about Prespa, it is a done deal, but we still need to invest in it. We need to consolidate it, and partly the European uh, start of the accession talks is a very important step to consolidate Prespa because, it, it, among other things, it was also about unlocking the European future. Ja. Also, uh, von dem allem, was ich höre, wird der Bericht der wirklich sehr positiv ausfallen von der EU-Kommission, was uh, Nordmazedonien betrifft. Aber es gibt äh, zwei Staaten innerhalb der EU, das sind vor allem Frankreich und die Niederlande, die äh, äh, zurzeit äh, noch äh, Widerstand, wenn es darum geht, äh, äh, Nordmazedonien und auch Albanien äh, zu gestatten, in der EU Beitrittsgesprächen zu beginnen. Jetzt meine Frage ist an Sie, das ein mögliches Datum wäre ja eine Entscheidung im Juni beim EU-Rat, wie wahrscheinlich ist das, dass Nordmazedonien Nord heuer noch mit den Gesprächen beginnen kann, dass der EU-Rat das äh, grüne Licht dafür gibt? Und was äh, ist, wenn dem nicht so wäre? Well, I think there are people around this table that are more suitable to maybe to respond to the question, how like it. I, I, I think that this year we will start the session talks. See, the stakes are simply too high. And uh, because if, if the EU fails to recognize this progress, you can't really talk about accession as an existing policy. And this, uh, I don't think the EU will simply fail to use this. Uh, now, um, this is not such a big deal for long. It's a level playing field to compete with others that are already in the top, like Montenegro or Serbia, on who reforms better, on whose media are more free, and whose anti-corruption commission leaders more. This is what we want. Uh, we don't, I don't think that anything will happen in terms of joining, in terms of, by the time we are at the end of the process, we have to have a situation where people will like us. Because it won't be a burden. And we are talking about the start of the process. So I think that it is likely that this will happen. I'm very optimistic. Um, I don't really know when. There are many challenges, but I, I'm, I'm a very naive accidental politician, and I think doing the right thing actually works. And if this is uh, a positive decision of the European Council on North Macedonia this year, it's the right thing to do. 
Ich muss jetzt noch einmal kurz nachfragen. Ähm, ist es so, dass im Zentrum dieser Erweiterungspolitik immer die, die Konditionalität stand? Also die Staaten mussten das liefern und dann ähm, haben, sie, haben sie weitere Schritte in Richtung EU machen können. Oder eben auch nicht, wenn das jetzt nicht so wäre, dass es ähm, innerhalb der EU eine Zustimmung äh, gibt, ähm, dann würde das ja auch dieses Konditionalitätsprinzip in Frage stellen. Und meine Frage ist dann, würde das bedeuten, dass die Erweiterung tot ist? Und was würde das dann für Auswirkungen haben, nicht nur auf Norden, also nur auf den Balken insgesamt? Ich glaube, das ist Principle of conditionality. This is what we want. If you deliver, we deliver. These are three conditions. If a country delivers and there is no response, then we don't have the principle of conditionality in reality. And this essentially, then everything is possible. Then it's about politics and politics. So this is why I, I think this is at the very heart of the accession. What we should discuss is whether we have delivered. But if independent, impartial organizations, we will see now what the Commission will say, we will see what the German Embassy for the Scope will report. If the sum of these reports are, these people are serious and they're moving their country in the right direction, then you have to recognize, otherwise, there is no accession policy, and otherwise, Everything is possible. And I think the fundamental question here is do we care about this region from the perspective of the EU, Germany, and other countries? And what, what's the vision to, for this region in 10 or 20 years? Do we want to make this region more European and more prosperous so that it becomes become a non-issue, a non-topic, or, you know, so these are the state. What happens is it makes us weaker, <coughs> these political forces. We still have to fight the fight. It's our country that makes us weaker. Many other uh, international players will be, will resonate more, other kinds of agendas, maybe nationalists could be Uh, because I think we defeated fear with hope. And we want to deliver on that. Genau, in diesen zwei Punkten wollte ich ähm, noch nachfragen. Das eine ist ähm, der Nationalismus. Äh, Sie haben das ja sehr, sehr gut beschrieben, dass es in den Verhandlungen darum ging, äh, diese Blame Games zu beenden und nicht mehr zu machen. Und meine Frage ist jetzt, was kann man jetzt aus diesen erfolgreichen Verhandlungen lernen, äh, wenn man die Nachbarstaaten anschaut? Äh, die größte offene Frage, ich habe sie schon angesprochen, Serbien und Kosovo, ähm, die, der Normalisierungsprozess. Ähm, da hat man ja nicht wirklich den Eindruck, dass die Blame Games äh, aufhören. Und meine große Frage wäre, ähm, was können was können, könnte man in der Region aus dem positiven Beispiel Nordmazedonien lernen, wenn es um die bilateralen Verbesserungen von bilateralen Beziehungen geht? I talked about that a little bit when explaining the, the press part. Um, I mentioned former minister. Nikos Kotias. It wasn't always flowers and uh, good things. We yelled at each other on the phone directly. Uh, I told him we met in Sunia, which is a, place, a beautiful place near Athens with the temple of Poseidon. Uh, it one of the myths, the legends of the king, the king of the Jews who jumped off the cliff, thinking that his son was killed in the fight against the minor power. So I said, if we don't make progress here, let's jump off the cliff and die. <laughs> and he said, okay, 
But let me warn you, I'm a good swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we yelled at each other, but we did it uh, not through the public. So, um, not that there were no temptations on both sides. But it's, I think it's how committed you are. You, you can't, for instance, you cannot negotiate with Greece to resolve the main issue. And in parallel, work with third, third countries to increase the recognitions of the constitution. Simply, you can't reconcile the two processes. If you're serious about it, you have to focus on uh, the country that you hope to become friend of and partner. And you have, you have to invest all of your cards in this process. Um, and see if there is a solution where the key interests of the one and of the other are possible in one form. Creative, the element of time, the element of presentation, but public plan never helps. And in parallel, you have to work at home with your own constituents. And this is extremely difficult, both in Greece and on our side. Uh, it is difficult, but it has to be done uh, in order to be sustainable. Especially with an issue that has been misused for so long. You know, and both extremes are. So um, it's possible, political will, uh, no parallel processes, no blame games, less public positions as possible. Because when you repeat your position publicly, it becomes a red line. And then you have to talk about the interest because you never know how to arrive at a formula that covers the needs of both sides. Is it helping humor? Humor is helping. Yeah. Was mich zu der nächsten ernsten Frage bringt, noch einmal kurz Kosovo Serbien. In diesem Zusammenhang. Was mir aufgefallen ist bei Mazedonien, was ich ähm, so interessant fand, ist eben der, ähm, die, also als, als Bedingung für das Gelingen, das Ende dieses ähm, extremen nationalistischen Rhetorik, die innerhalb von Nordmazedonien was dazu geführt hat, dass es ähm, auch eine Kooperation mit albanischen Parteien gab und die natürlich dann auch das Verhältnis zu den Nachbarn verändert hat. Wie sehen Sie das im Zusammenhang mit Kosovo Serbien? Wie wichtig ist das, also die Abkehr von diesem Ethnonationalismus? I, at some point, I, I said, uh, looking about greater countries. The only greater country we want to see is uh, Greater Europe. Uh, in order, I mentioned the next generation. In order to help them have a better start than us, nationalism won't help. I think we need a constructive, objective, visionary patriotism that is about the issues they really face. Jobs, pay jobs, healthcare, education, a functional system of checks and balances, and a competition on capabilities and not on party line. Fighting corruption and clientelism is what will make us European. If we continue with, so I think we have to change, let's say we are able to, to meet one nationalism. Demands of one nation, be it borders or what? Um, if we open uh, the discussion on nationalism in the Balkans, by the time we are done, the whole of the next generation will live elsewhere. We 
have to talk about the issue that matter. And these are reforms, this is corruption, economy, healthcare, you know, this is what matters. This is, and um, we can, because usually, I find it in, in our case, it was obvious, we heard it during the White House affair, nationalism was a package to hide corruption. And then, because of the events of the White House affair, we saw how this worked. So, um, this is why writing corruption is more important. The package is there for some time, but then we see what happens, right? So I think we, we have to talk about the real issues. It's not the inability of politicians to deliver on the things that matter is the key temptation of why they would use the flag of nationalism. You know, if we are able to deliver on what matters for the next generation, this flag won't work. And what we have is a nation, a society that demands on the thing that matter. Because the flex was made, didn't help much, and now we need to go in a different direction. And the whole issue must be that way. We have to go on. What kind of impact does it have uh, regarding the discussion on the landscape? The other uh, changes? I, I, I only believe in less borders in the region, which is about, you know, right? Uh, in Europe, borders don't matter much. And I think this is the, the future of the region. This is the vision that brings sustainable stability. It's not fair to talk about um, the landscape because the public never found out what exactly the discussion was about. So I think we have to be, let's say, uh, with an approach to the proper issue with a measure of caution. Because this was not in the public domain. Uh, and I think as a neighbor, we only have two. First of all, this is up to the language. But we, as a country that neighbors both, in a country of the region, uh, we have a legitimate interest to support and help with a solution that will increase regions, which is also very important. And we hope that our experience and press public inspiration to go towards reconciliation and Resolution. And we think this is why it is important for the EU not only to praise PRESPA with words, but also with deeds. Because it's important to set an example that resolving deep problems is the European way, and this is recognized and properly uh, reported. When it comes to stability, um, I think by the end of the year, I think next year, North Macedonia I'm going to join NATO. Um, before I will open this debate in the public, I would like to ask you um, what you expect from that and um, in terms of security architecture in the Balkans and what is the reaction of Moscow? Um, for us, uh, joining NATO is unfinished business. We should have been here some time ago. Uh, it's also a very important strategic goal, supported by 84% of the citizens. For this region, where not to forget NATO had the first intervention <coughs> ever in 99, uh, NATO means a uh, message that this country is here to stay within the borders. So for us, it brings stability and predictability. It also brings obligations to invest in our deployable uh, military force. So if we are actually of use, we are useful for the rest of the allies. 
so it brings also obligations that we take very seriously. And it's, in regionally speaking, it is the expansion of the zone of LTD stability in a region. Russia doesn't hide that this is, that they're not very blessed. To put it mildly, to this development. Um, but I tell them, and I continue, I will continue to tell them that this is our decision. We do it for our citizens. I am actually offended when some press releases from Moscow say that we are doing this for someone else. We are not. And it was difficult enough for this. And that whoever is interested in more stability and predictability of developments should understand this uh, Whether uh, every political center in the world is interested in most developments, perhaps is a legitimate question. Uh, and Having been part of NATO should not necessarily mean to have an extremely unfriendly relationship with areas where we can cooperate and we do cooperate. And at some point, there will be leaders who will find a way to resolve this problem between NATO and Russia. Yeah, thank you, Phil.